Hello everyone, what's up? In tonight's video I'm gonna show you how I built, painted and weathered this Star Wars Legion TX-225 tank from start to finish. So I know that there's a bunch of unboxing videos of this particular model out there, but since I know that many of you are not familiar with this kit or with the Star Wars Legion game, I thought I would start from scratch this time. The presentation as you can see is superb. We are treated to a really nice box art and also to a clear view of the unpainted model and the accessories that come with it. The first surprise, however, is that the whole of the hull is actually a single chunk of plastic. There is nothing to assemble there, and in spite of that, this is no simplistic toy. The level of detail is actually quite remarkable for this scale. The second surprise with this unboxing is that there are no plastic sprues whatsoever. The remaining parts, and there aren't many, all come in individual plastic bags. Here we can see the instructions, which are very well laid out, and the third surprise, which is the fact that all in all, there are only 16 components, and that is if you choose to have a pintle mounted weapon. All in all, it is clear that the production values are extremely high, from the packaging to the kit itself. So let's get this baby built. Since this is a plastic kit, not resin, I'm using my favorite glue, Tamiya Extra Thin Cement. The first thing I did was to glue the two hatches. This is easy to do even for a klutz like me. Now for the sponsons. Again, look at the beautiful simplicity of that design. Here's the front gun, a bit fiddly for my standards of dexterity. And now it's time for the tracks. Check this out guys, each side consists of just three parts. Same as with the ATST that I painted recently, I decided to go with Tamiya XF paints with lacquer thinner for the undercoat, instead of using a primer. For this, I mixed flat black and whole red in equal parts and then diluted this 50% with lacquer thinner. This has a lot of bite, a lot more in fact than any acrylic primer. This was important to me because of the abuse that I knew I was going to subject the model to in future stages. As you can see, I first spray a very thin mist over an entire area and then move on to the next. This way the adherence of the paint will be even greater and will build up a nice even coat. If you're intrigued about Tamiya paints and why it is that I use them, I'll be doing a video soon on the different types of paint available to both wargamers and scale modelers. I don't want to bore you to death with several minutes of just me spraying an undercoat, so let's speed things up. This is what the finished undercoat looked like. Now for the foundation of all the other weathering steps, liquid mask chipping. For this we're going to apply Humbrol Mask Hall with a bit of kitchen sponge held with pliers. First we unload most of the product onto some kitchen paper, just as if we were dry brushing. Then we're going to gently dab our sponge at surface details, corners and any other surfaces that might get wear and tear in real life. As I said in my recent ATST video, this may look weird at first, but trust me, unless you're a master modeler like Nightshift, this technique is your best bet to get convincing chipping on your vehicles. Not convinced yet? Wait and see. So long as you don't apply excessive pressure or use too much liquid mask, there is nothing to worry about here. Okay. 
As you can see, controlling the placement and the size of the chips is really easy. If for some reason you get a patch of mask that you really don't like, simply wait a few minutes and then remove it. No harm, no foul. After letting the liquid mask dry for about half an hour, we're getting ready for the base coat, which consists of sky grey and flat white in roughly equal parts, thinned 50% with lacquer thinner. The main thing here is that, like before, I apply a very thin initial coat on each part of the vehicle, moving on to the next before applying a second coat, and so on and so forth, building up opacity gradually. Once I was satisfied with the level of opacity, I added some more watt to the mix and then applied some highlights with the airbrush. Now I'm never one for garish highlights, but in this case I was even more restrained than usual, as I didn't think that the rather peculiar shape of this vehicle lent itself very well to highlighting. It's very flat, but at the same time it doesn't have any big panels without surface details, so it's a bit tricky. The drying time before the next stage was something like 20 minutes. As some of you will know, this is my favorite time in any project, scrubbing the tank with a vengeance. Combining lacquer paints with liquid mass chipping is an invention of mine, and you could say that it has become my trademark. What you see happening is that I'm peeling off the liquid mask, obviously, but that is not all. The level of friction that I'm inflicting on the surface is causing what I call mechanical weathering. In other words, we're not simulating scratches, paint fading or chips. We are actually causing them. And here you can see the process in slow motion. I assure you this is even more satisfying than it looks. And these are the results of our chipping efforts. The reddish areas that you can see are the result of the paint fading, and this I'm quite proud of. To replicate this with other methods would be no easy task. Time for some varnishing. I'm using Tamiya Clear thinned with lacquer thinner. This product is very easy to use and creates a very smooth gloss finish which greatly enhances the capillary action that we will need for our pin wash. Unlike with the paints, here I take a more heavy-handed approach, spraying our varnish rather liberally in a couple of coats and finishing with what some people call a wet coat. With the lacquer thinner, this product dries so fast that there is no waiting required between one coat and the next. Now for a spot of pin washing. I'm using Dark Wash by Ammo of MIG, which is an enamel wash slightly thinned with odorless thinner. The other paint well is for me to clean my brush every now and then. To apply the pin wash, I'll be using a synthetic liner brush. All you need to do is to lightly dab the surface with a loaded brush, letting the wash flow by itself through capillary action. The enamel wash will then easily flow into all the recessed areas and around the details with no effort on your part and without staining the rest of the model. Having said that, there are always some minor spills, but the good news is Unlike with an acrylic wash, you really have nothing to worry about. We'll take care of them in the next step. Music 
without a shadow of a doubt, pun intended, a pinwash is a very easy, stress-free way to create contrast in our models. The only thing you have to be mindful of is the drying times. I always recommend to let your model dry for at least 2 to 4 hours unless you live in a very hot, dry climate. In my case, I waited 24 hours, yes, you heard correctly, and this was totally fine, as you will see in a second. On the other hand, if you don't wait long enough, the wash will be harder to manipulate and you're likely to make a mess or simply remove too much of it. In my experience, the best tool for blending a wash is a flat or angle brush slightly dampened in thinner. No matter what brush you use, make sure that it's not dripping wet. The idea is to either drag or push the excess of enamel paint with our brush. This way we can either make it accumulate in certain areas or we can simply remove it. Every now and then you should clean your brush, then dry it a bit again so that it's not too wet. Now I'm not gonna lie, this is time consuming, but it is quite easy to do and provides you with a safety net that you're never gonna have if you use acrylic washes. It's important to note that before moving on to the oil dots and let the model dry overnight and then apply the coat of Tamiya Flat Clear, which is a matte varnish. Time for some oils. I was going to use three oil brushes from Almo of MIG, namely Starship Base Lodge, Dark Brown and White, but in the end I only used the last two. The first technique that I used was to create streaking effects. For this I used the applicator brush that comes with the oil brushers and picked some of the larger chips. Normally I would use my synthetic saw brush with a bit of odorless thinner, but my experience with the ATST taught me that it might be best to try without any thinner first. And I was right, when applied this way, it's easy to make the streaks diffuse and subtle. Here you can see the same technique again on the other side of the tank. I will confess I did go a little heavy here because this was way too much fun to be restrained. The second technique with oils was an oil dot filter to lighten up some of the horizontal surfaces on the tank's upper hull or glasses. I stippled the oil paint with a short bristled makeup brush, which I highly recommend for this by the way. The effect is not very noticeable, but it definitely wasn't detrimental to the model, so I was happy enough. This was the second time that I used post shading, the first one being the ATSC. Now I have dedicated shaders from Almo of MIG, which are really excellent, but what I chose both times was a heavily diluted lacquer paint from Tamiya LP5 Semi Gloss Black, with approximately one part paint to four parts thinner. The first time around it was a bit of a risky experiment, so I didn't even record it, but thankfully it paid off. This time however, I really wanted to show you guys my particular way of doing this, but um, 
I stuck the airbrush in front of the camera like 99% of the time. So I'm really sorry guys, but this is all the footage that I could salvage. Anyway, the mix is extremely transparent, very easy to control, and dries immediately. The four main ingredients for success, in my opinion, are to keep the airbrush in motion, to aim well, to be very gentle on the trigger, and to build up the shading slowly. Now, bear in mind that I'm using a Badger Patriot 105 with a 0.5mm needle and that I'm not very good at airbrushing, so if I can do this, so can you. Like I said before, I wasn't too sure about this when I started but it really paid off. If you don't have access to lacquer paints, ammo shaders are a solid alternative. The finishing touch was to apply ammo engine oil to some areas. I was going to use wet effects as well, but I kind of chickened out in the end, I must confess. I thinned the engine oil a little bit and applied it like any other pin wash. This enamel not only looks exactly like the name suggests, but it's also shiny when it dries, which is why I applied it at the very end. As you can see, this also increases tonal variation and with very little effort. So here you have the finished results, guys. The only things you're missing in this video are the crates and the base for use in Star Wars Legion. The former will be a Patreon exclusive video, and the latter I want to try and make myself out of green stuff, but I really didn't have time for it this time. Next week I'll be back with two mighty Kugelpanza. If you want to know what the heck that is, check my social media accounts. In the meantime, if you want to know more about chipping, click on the video on the left. And if you want to see how I painted my ATST, check out the one on the right. Thank you all, and remember, keep it up and weather it out.